poltergeists, interdimensional beings, astral projection, quasars, math, King Henry VIII, ufologists, the Cheshire Cat, tachyons, time travel, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. This story blows my mind. So, of course, I need to share it with you. It is a veritable Roman glut fest of strange and mysterious topics all in one spot. Welcome to the in-between. I'm Carol Ann, and today we are investigating a very unique and truly bizarre event in the world of paranormal and the unexplained, the Doddleston Messages. For many of us, the year 1984 conjures images of dystopian futures now lost in the past. But for three people living in the small village of Doddleston in Cheshire County, England, 1984's dystopian future was a present-day quandary, a puzzle that would just get crazier and crazier for almost two years. Ken, Debbie, and Nicola, or Nick, were living together in an old cottage called Meadow Cottage in Doddleston. Doddleston is a little village in the county of Cheshire that was also the birthplace of Lewis Carroll and his Cheshire cat. Ken was renovating in his spare time, which there wasn't much of, so the renovation seemed to be going on forever. But just when the endless layer of cement dust covering absolutely everything in the house threatens to break the last threads of everyone's patience, they finish the main floor. Now, all it needs is a little paint. Late summer of 1984, the three notice a trail of what looked to be cement dust smudges trailing diagonally up the kitchen wall until they stop at the ceiling. They're an average looking size, but some prints look to have six toes. The three giggle about it and try to figure out how they were made without success. As their attention to them fades, so do the prints themselves, until they're almost invisible by late fall, when they finally have a chance to paint, adding some much-needed color to the cement gray walls. The next morning, Ken walks into the kitchen and stops in his tracks. On the freshly painted wall are fresh footprints. But these are not on the same track. They're on a different track than the old ones. So they're not just the same ones just coming through the paint. Ken and Deb are pretty perplexed, but Nick is pretty horrified and about ready to pack her bags. But instead, she grabs the paint and paints the new footprints away. Two days later, after a major food shopping spree, all three are too tired to figure out what to do with the extra cans of cat food and some other things. So the overflow is left on the kitchen floor to be dealt with in the morning. When the morning comes, Ken discovers the cat food cans stacked up in a neat little pyramid. All right, they decide this has to be a prank. But who? They decide it has to be Ken's friend, John. Ken has always suspected that John has a thing for Debbie. Odd way to show it, but whatever. Now, 36 hours later, they are treated to a four-foot-high precarious tower made of two two-liter bottles of lemonade, a bag of dry cat food, and a roll of paper towels. Ken starts to rethink the idea that this is John. He doesn't think John has the skills to pull this off. Anxiety levels start to rise. Everyday creaks and groans of an old house start to freak them out. Weird things are now happening on a regular basis, and John is looking less and less like the culprit. Now Nick is trying to move her career in a new direction toward the performing arts. So to try to help her out, Ken, who's an economics teacher at Hardin High School in Doddleston, is able to check out a BBC microcomputer fitted with the Edward II chip, which turned the computer into a very clunky word processor. Nick is totally excited because now she can really start working on writing some comedy sketches using the computer. 
After a short tutorial on naming and saving files on the 5-inch floppy disk in the connected disk drive, Nick is off and running or writing. One Sunday night in December, all three decided to take some time away from the cottage and go see a friend. When they return a few hours later, they see the green glow of the computer screen and realize that no one had turned it off before they left. No big deal. Ken sits down to take a look and sees that there's a new file on the disk named differently than the single letter names Nick had been using, like ABC. This one is called KDN. Intrigued, Ken opens the file. Now, just to let you guys know, I will be showing you the actual text of these messages on the video, but using a modernized translation for the audio just to make everything easier to understand. True are the nightmares of a person that fears. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn, pretty flower. Turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks. Pussycat. Pussycat went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. L.W. Weird. Ken was fascinated, but didn't really know what to do about it. As December passed, Nick left to go visit family for the holidays and didn't come back for a couple of months. So it wasn't until she was home again in February that Ken borrows the school's computer again. One cold Sunday, the three decide to go hang out at the Red Lion Pub for the evening. When they come back, another message is waiting for them. What strange words you speak, although I must admit that I have also received poor education. Sometimes I think changes are somewhat harmful, for they disrupt many nights of sleep in my bed. I have seen many changes around my house and your home. It is a fitting place, with lights that seem devil-made, and expensive things that only my friend Edmund Gray or the King himself can afford. It was a great crime to have corrupted my house. L.W. Well... That sounds a little ominous, considering the word bribed in early modern English means to corrupt. And who is L.W.? Who's Edmund Gray? And how are these messages getting on the computer? At first, Ken thinks it's one of the girls playing a prank. But how? They were both with him when both of these messages appeared. And this is 1985 now, so no network or internet connections. In late February, Ken asks to have a private word with another teacher, Peter Trinder. Peter is another teacher at Harden who, incidentally, had been Ken's English teacher when he was a student there and is a Tudor era English specialist with a degree in English from Oxford University. Ken tells him that he's getting these messages just appearing on the computer. Peter looks at the printouts that Ken gives him, and it takes him some time, but he finally gets back to Ken to say that the English used in some of the messages took him some time to look up, and in his humble opinion, it's unlikely a hoaxer would take that kind of time. But it's got to be a hoax, right? The threesome, now foursome, including Peter, asks LW questions to try to get their arms around what they are dealing with here. Did you live on this land in about 1620? Is the king James or Charles Stuart? Do you have a family? Through the continual back and forth, they find out that LW stands for Lucas Wayman, who says he's in the year 1521 and that the king is Henry VIII, who he says is 46 years old, and the queen is Catherine Parr. But Henry VIII wasn't 46 in 1521. Henry was married to Catherine from 1543 to his death in 1547. And there is more information that he gives that is just flat out wrong. But they decide not to challenge Lucas because they want to keep him talking. However, eventually, Lucas sends an angry message wondering if they are who they say they are why do they not challenge him on the things that he is saying that should be easy for them to disprove? He's been testing them too. 
And this goes on for months, with Ken giving copies of all of the new messages to Peter to decipher and opine on regarding whether or not they're legit, and helping Ken figure out ways to try and either prove or disprove their authenticity. Lucas seems to have lived in the same house that Ken and Debbie now live in and sends his messages through something he calls Aleem's Boist. Translation, light box. He says that he's a farmer whose wife and son died in the plague in 1517 and that he'd been a dean at Brazenose College at Oxford University. It also seems as if he can see and hear them as well. He talks about the impromptu jam sessions that they sometimes have with Ken's friends. And after Ken, a Jaguar sports car fanatic, leaves him a magazine cut out picture of a Jaguar, Lucas remarks that his cart won't get far without horses and even asks what the picture is printed on because it's so smooth. Debbie has a whole other level of strange happening as she seems to be able to see Lucas as well, sometimes falling into a dream state where she finds herself literally with him. Not to mention that it also seems as if Lucas can send them physical messages as well, leaving notes on paper or scribbling messages on the stone kitchen floor with chalk. Ken reaches out to the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR. And this is not some fly-by-night organization. These guys have been around since 1888. They send John Bucknell and Dave Welsh, who quickly zero in on Debbie as being the hoaxer. She immediately says, wait a minute, I'm only 19 and haven't a clue how people talked 400 years ago. That answer seems to suffice with John and Dave for now. And of course, nothing happens while they are at the cottage. That's okay, they say, we'll be back. But Lucas has gone silent only to have his mantle taken up by some unknown stranger, letting the foursome know that Lucas has been arrested for witchery for sending the messages through the light box. You're a foolish scoundrel who has brought nothing less than evil upon the wretch. I hope he comes to no harm, for I guarantee your death by my own hand some way. It was not to be avoided with your charm of lights, and now he sits in the shameful dungeon. It will be your own ruin, Unless you help Lucas, he will die. If you reveal yourselves to the crown for what you are and display your devilish powers, then his life is saved. Reveal the truth and give no false threats and explain what is necessary, computer. Friend of Lucas. The SPR comes back again a few days later, seals up the doors and windows so no one can get in or out, and plants microphones all over the cottage hoping to catch keyboard noises made by the perpetrator. Nothing. Ken suggests that maybe Lucas isn't writing because he's been executed. And the SBR guys think, How convenient. But they say they'll be back. Ken and Debbie find out from Lucas's friend that the sheriff hasn't executed Lucas yet because the box only works when he's around. And the sheriff wants all the power the box presumably holds. Feeling pretty responsible for Lucas's predicament, they actually managed to have a conversation with the sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlshurst. They tell the sheriff that unless he releases Lucas immediately, they will use the power of the box to damn his soul to hell. And holy crap, it works! If you swear to not use your power, then I shall release Lucas within one hour. Lucas is home again, at least for the time being. They also find out his real name is Thomas Harden. Ken mentions that he's from the year 1985, at which Lucas is shocked, answering, You said your time is 1985, though I thought you were also from 2109, like your friend who brought me the light box. He said the box was brought to him by someone named One from 2109. More than a little taken aback by this, Ken decides to message that person too and types into the computer, calling 2109. And in less than an hour, they get a reply from 2109. We are sorry that we can only give you two choices. One, 
then you either have your predicament explained in such a non-rhyme way that you may have instant understanding, but cause what should not be to happen, or... 2. Try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall, in your lifetime, change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say, is that we are all part of the same God. Whatever he is. Well, isn't that interesting? Now, they're talking to the past and the future. So Peter tries to question 2109 and gets scolded for endangering the mission. Meanwhile, Lucas has agreed to answer some questions from John Bucknell from the SBR. It's also important to note that through all of this, the poltergeist activity is still happening, and it sounds like it's happening to Thomas, too. All the while being reminded by 2109 that should they learn too much information about one another, the entirety of humanity could be at stake. No pressure. So everyone but John heads out to the red line while he sits for hours waiting for an answer to the questions that Lucas has agreed to answer. Nothing until the group are on their way back. Only then does a message pop up on the monitor. John thinks they must be transmitting the messages to the computer, like wirelessly somehow. That's when a rather interesting message comes through. Please tell me why you move my writings to 2109, for I do wish communion with my friend John. In other words, 2109 is messing with the messages and immediately answers Lucas's questions with Do not speak with psychic men. But Dave has an idea. Alone in the kitchen with the computer, he writes 10 questions to 2109, leaves the computer off, hides the screen so no one can see the questions, and goes into the living room with Deb and Ken to wait. After a while, with no response, Dave turns the computer off without saving the questions so no one can figure out what they were. 2109 responds. Yes, we are what you would call a tachyon universe, but your understanding is incorrect. We ask nothing more of you than to carry on as you would prefer. Not answering their questions directly, but answering them all within the text of the entirety of their message. This gets Dave's attention, and he comes back with two more questions for 2109, asking 2109 to tell us the next largest prime number over the largest one we know to date, and if he can solve Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem is a mathematical puzzle that Fermat, sometime around 1637, said had an answer. But people had been trying to prove that theorem unsuccessfully ever since. 2109's response? Dave, yes, both questions can be answered. One directly, the other requires an understanding of the new conversion formula. Before we tell you, do you swear to grant us our wish? Dave's response? If it be within our power to do so and that we do not lose our minds or souls or bodies to you. 2109 then let the man who is willing to lose these step forward. To lose your soul is to lose all. But surely this would not bother David. Call our bluff. Cheeky. David is not willing to take that bet. Ken tries to reason with 2109, but I guess no means no. Telling Ken. Answer either yes or no. You asked a question. We answered it. Your turn. If we are to answer questions again. Do you want the answer? Ken and Debbie certainly think about offering Dave's soul for him, but decide against it. Not giving 2109 the yes or no answer it's waiting for, it writes, We'll catch the bullets before you pull the trigger. Lots of love. 2109. So 2109 has the answers to the questions that Dave now can't ask without offering his soul. Checkmate on SPR. John reverted to his original theory that the computer is somehow bugged, and that is pretty much the last they hear from the SPR. Ghosted. 
can Debbie and Peter continue their messages back and forth to both Thomas and 2109, and now a third entity known only as One. In fact, Thomas says that One is the one who came out of the green light in Thomas's fireplace to give him the Leams Boist. One seems to also be from the future and is aware of 2109. 2109 and One seem to be somewhat rivals and both take turns at playing good cop, bad cop, with Thomas wondering the whole time, what the hell is going on? It becomes clear that the only way Thomas can be sure that his notes to Ken and Debbie will not be messed with is to write them on physical paper, which he does on several occasions. By December of 1985, one of Ken and Peter's former students, Neil Bartlam, who now works for the local newspaper, The Chester Observer, sits at a table listening to Ken and Peter tell their story. And much to Ken's delight, he's not laughing at them. Ken cringes at the thought of this article actually being published that could very well throw them under the bus. Most interestingly, Neil is able to talk to John Bucknell of the SPR, who does basically throw them under the bus, saying that he believes human agencies are responsible. At this point, Ken's growing more and more frustrated the lack of help to figure out exactly what is going on in their house. So he calls the SBR again just to get copies of John's case file, which John claims he files on every case. The SPR tells him they have no case file. And not only that, but John Bucknell is in the wind with no one having heard from him. And they've never heard of Dave Welsh. Case? What case? That's when 2109 offers Ken a lifeline. 2109 sends a message that says, In order that you may pay a little more attention to our needs, we ask you to do the following. There is a brilliant researcher, ufologist. We know you don't like the word. His name is Gary Ambro. His ideas differ somewhat to yours. Nevertheless, he can help you with a couple of your problems. You may phone him at the number below and invite him to talk with you. When he comes, show him this and ask him what he makes of it. Peter must do the telephoning. So they call him. Gary listens to their story, curiosity piqued, and then comes over and conducts some of his own tests to try to figure out what's going on. 2109 makes it known that they want to communicate with Gary privately, with Ken printing out 2109's side of the conversation, sealing the printout in an envelope, which they deliver to Gary. Gary gets the message and writes a reply, also sealed in an envelope, which Ken then places on top of the computer, which then, sometime over the course of the next few days, disappears. It's important to know that by this time, Debbie has rented a new place not far away from the cottage in Doddleston, but far enough away that they can get some sleep and relax for a hot minute. So they're no longer at the cottage 24-7. Ken starts to get annoyed at the cat and mouse game happening around him, but 2109 tries to reassure him. Ken, thank you. We do notice your hard work. Thomas will be back as soon as possible. Our conversation with Gary will not be of interest to you. We aren't plotting anything against you. And this goes on for a while, with Gary starting to play hard to get when he hands Ken a message for 2109. Only this time, it's not in a secret envelope. Greetings. I am instructed to apologize, but in any event, I would have done so of my own volition. There will be a letter hopefully this weekend. I'm also instructed to apologize to Ken and Debbie. I must try and answer your last letter. It would appear that you are more important than I had realized in the scheme of things. Gary. And with this final note, Gary's now in the wind too. Thomas tells the once again threesome, since their friend Nick has moved out by this time, that he's getting evicted from his land and plans to try to go back to Bracenose College at Oxford and write a book about this entire experience. The final message from both Thomas and 2109 come around the middle of March, 1986. 
Thomas writes, One day you will all sit at my table for wine and meat by my river in Oxford, where we shall read each other's books and rejoice. We shall speak of truth and good men, watching Oxford change together for evermore. In your time, my book is old, but I shall not go to my God until it is written. Then we will all be truly united. My love to you all. I shall wait for you in Oxford. Thomas. But since he can't really tell anybody about it without being thrown in jail for witchery again, he'll have to hide it someplace. He promises he will hide it where it will be found someday. Has anyone found it? Nope. 2109 signs off with... Ken, Deb, Peter. True are the nightmares of those that fear. What you fear will be your reality if you let it. Believe in yourselves. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. As long as your kind cannot penetrate our world. We are safe. We will finish now. You have a lot of work to do. There is no need for you to write back, as we will have gone. Thank you for your cooperation. 2109 When all is said and done, over 300 messages are received by Ken and Deb. Huh. Woo! Where do we go with this one? I guess it really only boils down to two choices. Either it's a hoax, or it's not. So let's talk about the possibility that this whole thing is a hoax. And let's start with the obvious suspects that Ken and Debbie staged the whole thing. There were never any signs of a break-in or that anyone else was ever in the house without them knowing about it. And at least one of them was usually in the house when the messages came in. They could have just added some poltergeist activity stories for a bit of flavor, piled up some furniture for pictures, instant haunting. Also, in the 1996 BBC television show, Out of This World, which featured a segment on this case, Dr. Laura Wright, a linguistics expert from Cambridge University, said this. Looking at the verb structure, there are things which Lucas says that would not have been said in 1546. It's true that individuals can make up individual words, but we don't make up our verbs. It's possible, or it was possible in England in 1546 to say, I do, thou dost, he, she, or it doth, he, she, or it does. But it wasn't possible to say, I doth, or he, she, or it dost. Now, all the way through um, Lucas's messages, he mixes and messes up these suffixes with the wrong subject. Uh, if, if it's meant to look like early modern English writing, it doesn't even look close. Thomas should have been educated enough to know better. She also analyzed the usage of adjectives before nouns in both Thomas's messages and known writing samples from Ken. She found that Ken's adjective usage was 26.6%, while Thomas's was 26%. But writings from that period generally have a much higher usage at 32 to 35 percent. So it seems as though Ken and Thomas are one and the same. Or maybe it was an outside hoaxer intent on pranking Ken and Deb. If that's the case, well played, my friend. Of course, the other option is it's real. Like I said before, there were never any signs of a break-in from an outside intruder. And there were times that the messages came in when no one was home. And we have statements from Debbie's mother and brother attesting to the fact that they were at the cottage with the kitchen locked up tight so no one could go in there, sitting with Debbie in the living room when a message came in. Not to mention the 10 question test by the SPR. Their big beef was that their questions were only answered in a general sense, not one by one. But if they were answered under their own testing procedures, namely that only Dave knew the questions, not Ken and Deb, how can they claim hoax? And since the computer came from a pool of loner computers, it would be really tough for someone to mess with the computer itself, since Ken didn't check out the same one every time. They would have to rig all of the computers. And what exactly does that mean? 
No one ever came up with a plausible way to rig the computer to behave the way it behaved in the first place. Not to mention, um, 1984. So no Wi-Fi or internet. So no direct hacking. Ken and Debbie found out later that the SPR had continued its investigation just without their knowledge. And they concluded that John Bucknell's conclusion that the computer had been tampered with was impossible. I think John Bucknell's idea was that someone was sending messages through the ground wire of the house, but even his own organization can't buy that one. And what hoaxer is going to camp out outside this cottage for 18 months waiting for their chances to sneak in and continually prank this random couple? In a tiny village like Donaldston, chances are they'll get caught by somebody. In 1989, Ken wrote his book on the whole adventure called The Vertical Plane, with an updated second edition published in 2021. The Vertical Plane being the way 2109 described time as happening all at once, not a two-dimensional line the way humans generally visualize it. Ken and Debbie participate in the 1996 BBC program Out of This World, but with their backs to the camera for anonymity. Other than the book, Ken pretty much stays out of the limelight. But apparently, Debbie can be occasionally spotted online. Neither of them seem to be interested in cashing in on a story that certainly has cash potential. And neither of them had anywhere close to the level of knowledge of Tudor-era English required to pull this off. According to their friend Peter Trinder, who, remember, is an expert himself on Tudor-era English literature and who also appeared on the episode of Out of This World, said the vocabulary is a mix of educated and uneducated and would be really tough to hoax. It was very real. That's all I'm saying, Richard. It was very close. The kind of thing that you could not doubt. But all the time one was aware of the possibility of hoax. But if it was a hoax, by golly, it was brilliant. If it's a hoax, the hoaxer would have to decide on their message, peruse the dictionary to figure out which words he could substitute to a word less common, and then go back through the dictionary again to make sure the iteration of the word is the correct iteration for the 16th century time period. Not only is this more work than the average hoaxer is most likely willing to commit to, but according to Peter, it would be impossible to do the research needed in the time frames given for many of these messages. They just wouldn't have enough time. But if you take what Peter says about the time and expertise involved, it sounds like someone would almost have to have a degree in early modern English just to have a clue as to where to start. And let's not forget about the poltergeist activity. Could a poltergeist have targeted Ken and Debbie and collected energy from their anxiety to fuel this whole escapade? They're here. Maybe. Certainly did manage to freak them out on more than one occasion. And many poltergeists have been documented as being a problem for multiple years, the longest covering a 12-year span. But to me, there are two things that make me kind of lean to the real category, the math and the quasar. Remember that question Dave asked 2109 about solving Fermat's last theorem? Well, 2109 didn't solve the theorem for Dave, but did tell him it would be solved sometime in his lifetime. <laughs> and lo and behold, here comes Andrew Wiles in 1995 to do just that. And 2109 told Ken that there was a quasar about to happen in the Delphinus constellation. And in 2019, there was. Now, those are pretty specific things to say that could not have been known in 1984. And as a small postscript, Gary Rowe, the ufologist, did resurface after a few years and said unequivocally that he believes every word of it. Now we just need to find Thomas's book 
Anyone want to volunteer to house clean Oxford University with me? Well, if nothing else, this story sure does challenge the way we look at time. In the words of Albert Einstein, the distinction between past, present, and future, it's only a stubbornly persistent illusion. As usual, this is one of those subjects that has way more information than I could fit in this video. So if you would like to read Ken's book, The Vertical Plane, there is a link to it in the description below. I highly recommend it as there are tons of details and backstory that add a richness to this whole encounter and fills in a lot of the blanks. Carol and ask me to say thank you and to show our appreciation for our Hoopy Fruit Level YouTube members. Whatever that means. So, thank you, Nexer E.H., Angela Smith, and Elizabeth Sisney. Without your generosity, the in-between couldn't keep the lights on, much less afford a camera that isn't a potato. And if you want to continue having your worldview rocked with another hidden book of knowledge, click this video right here. Be careful out there, and I will see you here again on The In-Between.